This week, online violence against women is under the spotlight. Studies show the abuse is driving many off social media and out of public life. Is the problem getting worse? What can be done about it? And are social media platforms failing women? Also, in our Women's Month feature, my conversation with humanitarian Noella Kosaris Musunka on what it takes to bring children, especially girls, in the DRC a 21st century education. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello and welcome. I'm Heidi Adams coming to you from VOA's headquarters in Washington. It's Women's History Month and Wednesday, March 8th is International Women's Day. It's a time to celebrate women's accomplishments and contributions to history and society. But this week we want to turn our focus to the way women are treated online. Now, social media is a powerful tool for women to run their businesses, run for office, protest against injustice, report the news, or simply express themselves. But it's also become fertile ground for online violence against women. Now, any social media user will tell you cyber bullies can target anyone, anywhere, at any time, often with little to no accountability. But according to Amnesty International, online abuse experienced by women can be particularly sexist and misogynistic. They face threats of physical violence, rape, even death. And studies show it is driving many off social media and out of public life. Uh, my guests today are Tina Power. She's an attorney and an analyst at the research firm Alt Advisory. She joins us from Johannesburg, South Africa. And also with me here in studio is Salem Solomon. She is a senior news editor in VOA's Africa News Division. Ladies, a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, Tina, I'm going to start out with you. Uh, please tell us what does online violence against women actually look like? Thank you, Heidi, and, and thank you for having us on the show today. This is an incredibly important topic that is something we, we care greatly about. Online violence and the use of technology to commit online violence takes place in various forms. It could range from harassing a person online, sending sexually explicit images, or making unwanted sexual advances. But we are seeing more and more that technology is assisting malicious and harmful actors in, in causing harm. We are seeing the rise of manipulated images or the development of deep fakes where audio, videos, or images are changed or altered. And these are placed generally women uh, in very sexually compromised positions, which is, is awful. We are also seeing the rise of doxing uh, where the personal information of women, of journalists, of activists, of politicians are shared online, their cell phone addresses, their emails, their personal addresses, and their physical addresses. And this is prompting a lot of threats of violence, threats of rape using different online social media platforms. Another concerning trend that we are seeing, uh, which you touched on earlier about women leaving social media spaces, is the silencing of victims and survivors where victims and survivors use online spaces to share their experiences of gender-based violence or of assault or of harm, they are now being met with sort of gag orders and responses from the perpetrators to try silence them from using these spaces to speak out. So on the one hand, technology is, is being used to facilitate the harm, and on the other hand, online spaces are being used to push women out or to silence them for speaking about their experiences and what they, they are going through. Uh, uh, Salem, as um, Tina referenced there, this, this is a dangerous phenomenon for women journalists in particular. Can you give us some more insight into how it impacts them and how it impacts their work? Right. Uh, the real life impacts for journalists uh, is that silencing, as uh, uh, she pointed out very clearly, silencing journalists who are providing public service, who are holding, uh, you know, the powerful to account. That is important. But the real life implications sometimes is that women journalists are harassed, stalked, 
followed. And so it has real life uh, ramifications. Uh, but I just, especially in parts of the world where women are starting and beginning to claw their way up in public spaces, uh, in office, in public offices, uh, it seems that the backlash tends to be more venomous, more violent in these uh, spaces. But I'd like to also point out, especially in our line of work, uh, you know, in newsrooms you hear, you have to have thick skin. Yeah, right. in, these, in these spaces. Um, we get that because of the, the way we write or the way we speak or uh, the nature of our work. We get feedback. But I don't think the same you know, responses are uh, given to or male, our male counterparts are experiencing similar uh, backlash. Most of these online harassments, it's not mostly about uh, what comes out of our mouth or what we write or what we think. Mostly misogynistic uh, attacks on journalists is meant to devalue their contribution, their career, their breadth of knowledge on subjects. It's mostly about how they look, how, you know, their body parts. And so it's very concerning when you think about uh, online harassment being disproportionate when it comes to our male counterparts. Yeah, it's the violence that we see against women um, perpetrated in society that spills over online. Uh, Tina, South Africa, of course, has legislation designed to protect women against online violence. How was the country able to do this? And is this law um, being enforced effectively? Thank you. It's South Africa's law reform process has, has been quite an interesting one, and I think it stems from a variety of factors. During sort of 2017, 2018, we were seeing some really powerful pronouncements coming from the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Women on the rising concerns around online gender-based violence, and this planted the seed in many ways in South Africa for, for us to start thinking about these issues from a legislative perspective. Then as the world continued to move more online, there was a general need for us to have more broad sort of cyber crimes protection. We then were, were really fortunate to have a robust civil society who actively engaged in the law reform processes and got to, to sit down with lawmakers. We had feminists, technologists, activists, all engaging on explaining the, the practical implications of online harms. And this resulted in our legislature and our, our lawmakers being very responsive to the need to provide legal protections. We also know that, that COVID had a, a role to play in this as well. As we became increasingly reliant on online spaces, we saw that the harms and the social ills such as racism, misogyny, harassment and sexism were playing out in online spaces as well. So there was a need to, to provide protections in these new spaces that we are increasingly relying on. And this has led to South Africa having quite a, a big bucket of, of legal protections. We haven't yet seen whether they're working together neatly or if there are, are some overlaps or, or some gaps. We do know there are ways and means for victims and survivors of online gender-based violence either to seek protection, to get protection orders or restraining orders when there are instances of online harms. And there are also options for victims and survivors to lay criminal charges to certain offences that, that take place in the online world. As to whether or not the, the law is working, many of these laws have been signed into effect in the last few years, so we are, are still waiting to, to see the full effect of the implementation. We have, however, picked up some concerning trends that police officers and law enforcement officials are not willing to accept these sorts of complaints because they aren't fully educated or, or engaged on topics of online harms and they are not willing to open cases because they don't see any physical assault sign or judicial officers not understanding the, the scope of social media and how content is shared and disseminated. So we, we're seeing a, a significant gap in terms of working with law enforcement officials and judicial officers to make the laws work. So we think if we can tap into that then it's likely that the, the laws themselves will become far more impactful and far more useful to, to victims and survivors. 
And Tina, I did find it very interesting that South Africa's um, laws related to online violence were actually part of the Domestic Violence Act. I was kind of, for some reason, thinking it would be part of more sort of free speech and, and the limits on that. But, but Salim, this does bring us into sort of that territory, right? Especially where journalists are concerned, the sort of free speech versus hate speech. I mean, where is the line on this uh, in general? I mean, and, and can these laws... Well, I imagine these laws can be a double-edged sword for journalists sometimes. That is correct. And, you know, there are arguments for and there are arguments against it. On the one hand, you know, online behavior, just as it is in, in person, it needs to be regulated, you know, especially when it's in, uh, c continuous and malicious. Um, you know, you need that kind of uh, legal uh, buffer to protect, especially uh, in spaces where young people are involved, when there's uh, cyberbullying, uh, the nature of harassment needs to be regulated in some way. So laws can help um, mitigate, especially, or prevent uh, real life impacts of, of things that bleed in the online sphere. But the uh, opposite argument is that uh, laws could also be used, especially in parts of the world that we cover. Authoritarian governments use it for um, uh, different purposes, and because you know, language could be uh, bended. Uh, you know, you know, in some, it could be used to stifle dissent. You know, silence journalists, civil uh, society, um, and, and, and there are examples of that because most of these laws, as earlier uh, mentioned, are nascent and they're very new. And so we have to be, I would say, very careful when we're pushing for stricter laws that might eventually uh, end up stifling the flow of information or the nature in which uh, conversation is as free uh, flowing online. Uh, Tina, what are social media uh, platforms doing to combat online violence? I mean, um, you know, do tech companies have a responsibility to their women users? Have they failed their women users? That's a, a tough question, and I think in, in some instances there have been positive efforts. We've seen with Meta's piloting of the stop NCII, which is the non-consensual non sharing of intimate images. That program was designed to empower victims and survivors to, to engage with the process more hands-on and take more control over their situation, and that was a, an interesting initiative. We've yet to see how, how far it's gone in practice. But there are some very real concerns, particularly with taking down content. And this has arisen in a case in South Africa where a young girl was threatened on a social media platform. She was threatened with, with rape and a whole host of other forms of sexual violence physically. And before her and her family could even get to the criminal stage, they needed to find out information from the social media user. And the social media company was placed in this difficult position where it needed to protect the identity and the personal information of the accused while the criminal proceedings couldn't continue whilst they had no access to information about who the, the accused person was. So social media companies have, have found themselves in this difficult situation. Could they be doing more? Always. There are also concerns around content moderation policies, the use of different language and different context. Uh, an offensive slur towards women in South Africa may not be something that a content moderator in California would pick up on or understand is, is harmful or, or hurtful or amounts to harassment. So all of the ordinary harms and, and challenges mm -hmm. we see with social media when it comes to, to regulating content, we, we see play out when it comes to online harms. But yes, there's, there are some interesting initiatives and we hope that they will be useful, but we've seen in our sort of personal work and some of the litigation that we've been exposed to that it's, it's, it's very difficult, particularly for our law enforcement officials, to work with social media companies. So if we can figure out how to bridge that gap to have law enforcement working effectively with the platforms, it's likely that we will see a lot more, more support for victims and survivors of this sort of violence. Uh, Salem, a, a report out last year by UNESCO called The Chilling looks at online violence against women journalists, but it shows it often goes hand in hand with disinformation campaigns, with discrimination, and often populist politics. Um, and, and this kind of abuse can be monetized. Tell us briefly, how does that happen? Right. Uh, that specific report that surveyed over 900 uh, women in 125 countries, 9% of those that were surveyed in that report said that, you know, 
malicious um, information, personal information, basically blackmailing reporters either to suppress what they're reporting about or getting access to their banking account, uh, home addresses, uh, you know, and so they can, you know, bad actors can monetize that using information like that, um, which is very troubling when you think about the broader implication of how uh, personal information could be used to make money off of um, innocent uh, victims. And so it's very uh, troubling to see, see this happening, but as you were saying earlier, you know, social media uh, platforms cannot be the silver bullet for uh, these problems. Yes, they might, when something is flagged, they should have a robust you know, response systems uh, uh, when something is flagged, when something is problematic. But the nature in which these platforms are, it's a communication platform. People will say, will, will say whatever they want, will post whatever they want. So you can't control every single thing. Uh, and so better uh, systems and newsrooms uh, that use these platforms um, and, and, and broader uh, impacts of, 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 of responding to these um, harassment uh, attacks might be the, 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 the larger solution. Um, well, this is certainly an interesting conversation, ongoing, chilling um, in the least. Um, Tina Power, Salim Solomon, thank you to both of you. Um, I know, Tina, that Women's Day is in August in South Africa, but I will still say a happy Women's Day to the two of you. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. Coming up here on Straight Talk Africa after the break in our International Women's Day feature, my conversation with the renowned model and philanthropist Noella Kosaris Musunka about returning to the country of her birth to bring girls in the Democratic Republic of Congo a world-class education. Stay with us. We'll be right back. In times of change, when the world seems uncertain, and what we hear doesn't reflect what we see. We seek the truth. When we are told only part of the story, we lose trust. In moments of crisis, our dreams, hopes, and wishes for a better tomorrow depend on a free press. At Voice of America, we bring you the stories that people take risks to see. We connect the world and unite it with truth. At Voice of America, we show you the whole picture. Welcome back. There are many ways to describe Noella Kursaris Musunka. She's influential, well known for her work as an international model, philanthropist and entrepreneur. The Congolese Cypriot humanitarian has been featured in magazines like Vogue, Forbes and Vanity Fair. She was born in the DRC. Her mother sent her to Europe at a young age to get an education. But she returned to the country of her birth with a mission to give children, especially girls, a world-class education in their own communities. She is the founder of the Malaika Foundation and here is a glimpse of her work. Malaika was a dream that was born out of my own experiences as a child. Back in 2007, Kalibuka was an underserved, underdeveloped community deeply impacted and isolated from a better future and from the rest of the world due to lack of infrastructure. I met girls, boys and women with so much potential, drive and passion, but with no opportunity to achieve their dreams. I saw the future leaders inside of these individuals and I knew I had to overcome challenges from cultural to logistical to financially, in order to provide them with free high quality education and health initiatives. From the beginning of Malaika, we realized we had to go beyond a formal education. We teach our girls to be leaders, building their confidence through sport, through peer education, and through challenging them on so many platforms. Today, over 50 million girls in Sub-Saharan Africa are out of school. I want to change that narrative, one student and community at a time. We must close this gender gap, starting by building the foundations for a strong, equal education system.
Now, a big part of Malaika's work is to prepare students for Africa's digital transformation. Earlier, I spoke to Noella Kosaris Musunka and I asked her about digital literacy and whether it is as important as literacy in language development. Here she is speaking to me from the United Kingdom. You know, we're working in a rural village where there's hardly no access of water, electricity. I will say, yes, the short answer is that digital literacy can be just as important as literacy in language development. However, it's really important to have a strong foundation in literacy in place before you start to incorporate technology. We see the program that we're doing with mothers and youth and adults, many of them didn't know how to write and read, and you need to really build up on that. We read and analyze great work of literature, encourage our students to write creatively and analytically, particularly in the early years of the education. We ask them to go spend a lot of time in the library. Once we have this foundation in place, we introduce computer technology into the classroom. And that's really, really, really key elements to take in consideration. And, and given the changing digital landscape that we're seeing, how have children's educational needs, especially those in countries um, like the DRC and in the sort of rural districts where you work, how have those needs changed from what they were, say, 10 years ago? Education needs uh, have changed because careers have changed, because technology has changed. In other words, the rise of automation and the many technological advancements we witness and prompting a need for an update skill set. Today, compared to 10 years, uh, education has a big focus on STEM and making sure that learners of all age become familiar with new technology in order to cope with changing workplace. Looking at a STEM offering in particular, we're introducing at Malaika, computers, tablets into the classroom, providing lessons on Microsoft Office tool, the internet, video editing, graphic design, as well as coding, robotic, artificial intelligence, IT programs, and one that prepare a student for the 21st century skills. And what have you found children, especially uh, the girls that you work with, need outside of what they need in the classroom? What do they need outside of school? They need support from their families and wider community in terms of normalizing girls being in school and receiving an education. They need less emphasized to be placed on their role as a caregiver and provider to allow them to study. They need access to sanitary products that they can continue to attend school without direction. And they just need to be focused when they come at school. At their home, they don't have TV, they don't have phone, they don't have social media, they hardly don't have electricity. So their environment and everything they're learning a lot is through the schools and the mentors they have and the teachers worldwide that are doing virtual classes with them. You know, I find the work you do in preparing students for high demand local jobs so interesting because we do see there is sort of a skills mismatch in, in many African countries between what that country's economy needs versus what students are actually trained for. Uh, what kind of jobs are local and in high demand these days? In uh, today's world, things are continually moving so fast. So it can be very, very difficult to predict exactly what demand will be next. And we're seeing that too in Europe with my children studying in England. But in Africa, we do know that we need to invest in high quality education, in high quality vocational training. That's why our training program at Malaika trains future mechanics, electricians. Looking at the Congo specifically, the country is so rich in natural resources. So mining is, is a huge focus in terms of jobs, meaning we must invest in mining engineers. Technology is also being integrated in all the industry and sector with a big focus on software, AI, digital tech, in the banking sector, for example. So we must really, really invest in, in tech. They are the two of the big trends we're witnessing currently. And I see gaining even more momentum over the coming months and years. And, and communication. Communication is really, 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 really key.
When you speak to young people in the places where you work, what do they tell you about how and where they see their future? You know, over the years, we created a, a Malaika talk series. So people, uh, we have uh, amazing people from all over the world coming to speak to a student face to face or they do virtual Malaika talks. And it's beautiful because they see their role, they see representation, they see what they want to become. And, and when we ask them, what do you want to become? Who's your role model? It's just beautiful. I see a passion for change within the girls and women who come to study at Malaika. Their dreams are so big. They know that they can, they can gain and earn money for themselves. They can help their families, they can help their community, they can help their community, and they can be mentors to the next generation. And that's really, really incredible to witness that. And Noella, you yourself, of course, are an international figure. You're an influencer, you're an ambassador for numerous causes. You on any day can be found on the cover of the most famous magazines. You could, if you wanted to, do good from afar, but I see you are very present in the places where Malaika's work is. How important is it for you to do this work, of course, in the country of your birth, but also for those young girls you work with to see you doing this work? I have two children and my children come with me every summer. I spend two months a year in the Congo. For me, after my two children, Malaika is my third baby. I give all my passion, my heart, because I believe in what we do, what we created over the 15 years. Having a, an impact in the Congo, I've been the driving force behind my work from day one. I left the Congo at the age of five when I was sent to Europe to receive an education. I was separated of my mother, my father died, and it was really my first visit at the age of 18 that sparked Malaika, what one day I wanted to create. During my visit, I met many girls, children whose story could have been mine. They were, back, they were held back from receiving an education, and I decided one day I will do everything that I can to give opportunities to children, to youth, to adults, to be in control of their own life. For me, the success of Malaika, lie, the success of Malaika really lies in fully fledged, comprehensive, local and on the ground approach, driven by the community, taught by the local amazing talent that we work, we have. We work with community members, organization local community, all the ground, all from the ground, and we train them, we put capacity building in our staff. So for me to be there is really, 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 really important. Absolutely, I need to find, um, I need to see the impact, I need to see the challenges, the success stories. I sit with my team uh, to see what can we do better, how we can monitoring, evaluate, how what can be improved, what what are missing in our program. And we always challenging ourselves and bring the level up. But when I go there, it's very, very tough. Uh, you know, you need to keep so focused on what you're doing because there's so many problems. You know, I just walk in, I walk every day in the villages and different villages and so many challenges, issues, problems, but you cannot solve everything. So you need to stick to your mission. You need to be very focused to your vision. You need to be working closely with your team and you need to be a leader with a lot of intelligence, emotional intelligence, with a lot of passion, compassion. And um, for me, I don't take any salary to, of Malaika. I give my skills, my time, my passion, and I cannot wait to see the next generation that will take over and that will become ambassadors of Malaika. And it will be a ripple effect, a domino effect. And I will be very, 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 very proud of, the, um, of this moment. And that was Noella Kosaris Musunka, founder of the Malaika Foundation, speaking to me from the United Kingdom. And that is our show this week. Thank you so much to my guests and to you for joining us on television, radio and online. Do enjoy the rest of this International Women's History Month. And in case you're wondering, International Men's Day is on November 19th. Thank you for always watching and always listening. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.